Welcome back to Cold Pop. I'm your host, Jim Hall, and we've got a wonderful guest in store for you today, uh, Jeff Vandermeer. Jeff was on about a year and a half ago or so, and he was just one of our most popular guests. Uh, his show was hit constantly, and I've been asked questions about him all the time. His books are amazing. Well, today we're going to have Jeff on. We're going to speak to him individually for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're going to have his wife, Ann Vandermeer, on who uh, the two of them are a great team. Uh, they edit all kinds of science fiction and fantasy together. And then Anne is the fiction editor over at Weird Tales. And that, if you're not familiar with that magazine, you should be. It's absolutely an amazing magazine. But first up, we're going to talk with Jeff Vandermeer. And uh, today he's going to talk mainly about Predator South China Sea, a uh, new book he's got out. And then we're also going to touch on Shriek, one of my all-time favorite books that uh, he wrote a couple years ago. It's just fantastic. But Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Uh, we, you know, I'm absolutely a huge fan of your work. And uh, judging from the hits we get at the website and people talking to me about the show, you've got a lot of fans here in Michigan and across the country that love my show and love your work. So thanks so much for being on. Uh, let's jump right in and get right first things first to Predator South China Sea, your new novel. I absolutely loved it. I told you uh, offline here earlier today when we were talking that I was wondering how I was going to like it because I don't read a lot of these type of books. I don't read a lot of Star Trek books or, or different things like that, serialized books, but I absolutely loved this. It took the best of your type of eerie, atmospheric type of stuff from Shriek, and then you pumped in all kinds of action and just made one hell of a novel. So congratulations. I really enjoyed it. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, first of all, thanks, thanks very much. I really appreciate that because I, I was a little nervous taking this on. Um, to me, it was a, a pretty simple thing technique-wise in that I was going to take the stuff that there's only a little bit of in my other work, which is, say, that fast-paced action, and I was just going to have that be in the foreground and everything else be in the background. So from a technical aspect, it didn't, it, it, it didn't seem like it would be that much of a challenge. Uh, I mean, it was that much different in a, in a way of just be doing more of, of what I had done before in small small doses. But um, but you know, when you get into a project like this, you realize there are all kinds of things you haven't thought of um, when you haven't when you haven't done a, a pure action novel. And uh, so I was really nervous as to how people would react to it. But so far, first of all, it's it satisfied the core Predator fans, which I'm really happy about because they're the people that I wanted to to first. Um, uh, first uh, satisfy and then the people who like my other work most of them have have enjoyed this there are some people who have refused to read it basically saying that i've sold out and therefore <laughs> they're not willing to read it but but they there's really very few people who have read it who haven't enjoyed it on some level so i'm, I'm really happy about that well i really really enjoyed it and i think it's a win-win situation uh you get uh, the opportunity to get your name out there to even more people that may not know your work sell more copies of Shriek and, and City of Saints and Mad Men and all your other work. And you also get to work in a great universe. Predator is a cool, cool character. But can you tell us about some of, are there some limitations when you're called in to do a novel like this? Do they put limitations on you as to where they want you to go, where you can't go? Or do they just give you free reign and say, uh, you know, go for it? Well, you know, it's actually a lot different from the Star Trek and Star Wars novels, uh, which I don't think I could ever do. I mean, I really have a lot of respect now for those people who do those novels because they literally have like thousand page Bibles of characters and situations and what you can and cannot do. Um, Dark Horse sent me basically three pages of do's and don'ts, um, which isn't very, very much. It was mostly to do with the weapons you could mention or not because some of them are copyrighted by different movie co corporations and things like that. So that was kind of the funny thing. It was like the restraints were very minimal. And uh, my editors at uh, Dark Horse, first Victoria Blake, uh, who now runs Underland, and uh, then Rob Simpson, were just wonderful. I mean, they, they really didn't change anything uh, that I put in there. And I, I put some some fairly radical stuff in there for a Predator novel. I mean, there are hints of the Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger character in there, which you're not really supposed to mention, uh, in the cigar-smoking guy. And mm -hmm. uh, I had some details about the Predator in terms of like things like... Uh, um, his uh, the so-called dreads, you know, the snakes coming out of his his head more or less as as being uh, you know for balance and things like that. And th those aren't little those little details aren't things that that uh, people had really fleshed out before. But what I really wanted to do with this one, you know, since it's the first time I've done this kind of novel, is I wanted to do basically an old-fashioned action adventure novel, like something that I could see Sam Peckinpah enjoying filming. And uh, so, so that's really what my cue was for it. It wasn't really to do anything really radical. It was to do something 
more straightforward, great adventure story, and then add to it, like you said, that weirdness. Uh, in this case, it's in the form of this uh, alien virus that infects this one guy. And uh, some of the stuff that comes out of that, I think, is much more like my Ambergris stuff. Uh, but no, it was a total blast to do. I, I've had never had, I've never had more fun actually than doing this novel. In part because it's the first novel I've written uh, since I, I quit my day job, and so it's the first time I've actually had time to just literally every day for like three or four months, uh, or actually in this case two months, <laughs> um, just sit down and do nothing but write for 24/7 if I wanted to. Um, I didn't even leave the house. In fact. Uh, at one point, uh, the, the, the the car got a flat in the driveway, and I was like, good, I'm not going to fix that until I'm done, because now I can't leave the house. Now I have to finish the novel. So. You got inspired to get more work done. Yeah, actually. Now, without giving too much away, I'm always leery when I talk about novels, you know, how, how much to give away or not give away. I don't think it's giving too much away to just tell a little bit about the setup for Predator South China Sea. And basically, it would make a great next Predator movie, that there's this island... A remote island in the South China Sea, and it's like a hunting lodge, for lack of a better term, for the extreme, extreme, extreme wealthy and crazy kind of nutso hunter people. And you've got a vast array of wild characters, KGB, an ex-wrestler, all just all kinds of people. Give give the folks at home a little description of, of what's going on in this novel and, and what's going on on the island itself. Right. Well, well basically, there's this ex- uh ex Khmer Rouge guy who, um, hold on one second, honey, you can't have, the cat's going to knock that over. Sorry. There's this ex Khmer Rouge guy who, um, who sets up a, a hunting lodge on this island. And, uh, he's basically taken the stolen money to, to do what he, what's his kind of, his, his version of like a Western dream of rags to riches. And he's done it for like three years and he has his own little private army on the island. And, uh, for like a half a million dollars, you can come to this island, you can hunt all kinds of exotic game. And, uh, the people who come this particular year all tend, all have their own agendas, uh, basically. You've got these, these, uh, these KGB agent guys who are following one of the other people who's there. You have these other people who are ostensibly there just to hunt, but they also are kind of involved in some arms deals. Uh, you have this uh, musician. This is, he's actually one of my favorite characters. Uh, this musician who uh, um, is uh, in a bit of trouble from uh, from uh, some indiscretions he committed in London, and and was told he was being sent on a travel holiday to the to, to Thailand, and instead he's <laughs> on this island um, with all these really bad people, um, and just trying to survive in in all of it. Yeah. And into the middle of this mix come a couple of Thai pirates and the predator and and. And, and what I really wanted to do is I wanted to have kind of a classic setup because, you know, a big game hunt gone bad is, is something we've seen before. But I wanted to start out, off with this setup that's relatively normal and, and, and somewhat ordinary and then kind of renovate it because I think by the time you get to the end of the novel, <laughs> you realize it's not, <laughs> it's not your typical big game hunt story. Um, no, I mean, you even got a conversation between this, uh, Romanian, uh, mobster and a crocodile. I mean, kind of in his mind, but, uh, but there's some scenes in there that that, uh, that I, I think are relatively unique. So, well, I, I think you did just a, a wonderful job, and I think you you really just nailed this one. I absolutely love it, and I know the sales are doing well, and people yeah. are really uh, proud of you and happy with it. So, again, congratulations. Now, while I've got you on individually, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up Ambergris and all that's going on in that wonderful world. Uh, Shriek and Afterward uh, is still out there for sale. I see it at, at all the bookstores. And I thought you might want to say a few things about that and also the fact that viewers, as they're watching this, uh, can get their hands on a special limited edition of the novel. So I thought you might want to talk about that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, there's a new uh, limited uh, Shriek uh, Afterward uh, a version from Worm Publishing. And it's this amazingly handsome hardcover, uh, signed, numbered, with a, a, a cover design by one of my favorite designers of all time, John Colthart, who did the, the uh, Thackeray T. Lamb's Head Pocket Guide to Eccentric and Discredited Diseases. It's got a, a cover by Ben, uh, the cover art by Ben Templesmith, who did the art for 30 Days of Night. Oh, yeah, cool. And uh, it's also got some extra material in the back, including some unpublished material from uh, from uh, the Journal of Samuel Tonsour. And, and people who are, are Ambergris fans will, will know what that means. It, that, that's actually some very important information that's in there. But the the uh, the star of the show in a way is there's this soundtrack that the church did for the novel, and started out as a very short uh, kind of uh, you know no 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 lyric uh, uh, 
thing for the short streak movie that was out, and then they 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 read the novel and they're like, well, hell, why don't we, you know, flesh this out and make it into a real soundtrack for the novel itself? And so it's it's 45 minutes, and uh, most of them are like uh, they're not experimental songs; they're just church songs, basically. You know, the the, the band that did uh, you know Under the Milky Way back in the 80s, right? And um, and it's just astonishing, astonishing to me how 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 much they took the novel at heart because they rendered down, you know long passages into the lyrics for the different songs and and there's actually a website up there in their discography where you can see their lyrics and then the part they took it from and they just took such care in putting it together and it's such a nuanced uh, piece and 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 the music itself for for each song fits so perfectly the emotions in that scene that that I was really kind of touched because it's one thing to say you're going to do a soundtrack like this it's another to actually show that you 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 totally got what it was that you were you know, making into a soundtrack. Uh, so it's just this great, uh, great, uh, great addition, I think. Um, it, it's just absolutely beautiful. Oh, I think that's a really cool idea. And it's especially great when, as you're saying, they really got what you're trying to do with the novel and really incorporated the music into that. So that's very cool. Yeah, and the thing about that is, you know, when I was writing Shriek, I was listening to the church most of the time. So it kind of makes sense that they would respond to the novel because, you know, I was kind of responding to their music when I was writing it. So I think there are even a couple of bits of places where I put lyrics of theirs kind of, you know, under the surface into a couple of the scenes. So so it's kind of neat. Excellent. Well, folks, uh, you can pick up the special uh, limited edition, as we're saying. Uh, You'll see the website uh, here on the show, or you can go to the Cult Pop website and link right on. You can also get the regular edition of Shriek or uh, City of Saints uh, and Mad Men is still out there and available. I see that at a lot of bookstores, so be sure to pick that up. And Jeff, you've also got some new Ambergris material coming in the not-too-distant uh, future here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the last novel in the Ambergris cycle, uh, you know, City of Saints and Shriek and now Finch, uh, which is about this detective. It's set 100 years after Shriek, and uh, the Grey Caps are these underground uh, inhabitants of the city have come come above ground and basically taken over the city and imposed martial law, and are building uh, two strange towers out in uh, out in the uh, the Bay Area of the city. And uh, in the middle of all this, this this kind of detective against his own will, because they're using human beings to control the the populace, uh, has to investigate this bizarre double murder of a human being and a and a gray cap. And uh, if he solves it, uh, <laughs> the uh, the rebel the, the human rebel force is probably going to kill him. If he doesn't solve it, his great cap uh, overlords are going to kill him. So he's in a very tense situation. And the novel kind of opens up from that. It's very much in tradition of hard-boiled thrillers, uh, but with a fantasy setting. And uh, what allowed me to do that is by setting it 100 years later, the level of technology is different. There are tanks, telephones, machine guns, you know, all kinds of, you know, things that you don't see in the more Victorian-type uh, era stuff from the previous books. And that kind of allows me to change the tone of it. It's very much a fast, action-paced thing, but it also really blends in the nuanced stuff I've done before. Um, and that, that's why Predator was kind of a nice training ground, too, for that, because it really taught me a lot about where to cut scenes if you want to create maximum tension and things like that. So Excellent. Um, and it takes place over seven days, which increases the tension, too, because <laughs> you got Monday, and horrible things happen by the end of Monday, and more horrible things by the end of Tuesday, and by the end of Wednesday, you're not really sure if he's going to make it out. So, sure. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, it's safe to say it's a page-turner at this point. Well, I'm I'm certainly looking forward to it. I've told you before uh, when we talked on the phone, and I've told you through emails how how much I just love the universe and I'm really, really looking forward to the next novel. But, Jeff, I'd be remiss if uh, we didn't kind of wrap up for right now sure. because we've got your wonderful uh, wife, Anne, waiting to get on the show so we can talk about a lot of the work uh, you two uh, work on together and then also Anne's work with uh, Weird Tales magazine, which we absolutely love. So why don't we take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll speak with uh, Jeff and Ann Vandermeer. So stay tuned to Cult Pop. Welcome back to Cult Pop. I'm your host, Jim Hall, and earlier in the show, we were speaking with Jeff Vandermeer, and now we've got his wife, Ann, has joined the uh, show. Ann, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work also, and I'm just pleased to have uh, both of you on the show now. Uh, well, thank you so much for such a kind introduction. Uh, and first of all, before we get into the novels, I want to give you an opportunity uh, to promote Weird Tales. You're doing just a spectacular job. Uh, you're the editor of the literature that comes on there, the fiction editor. 
and you're doing an amazing job. 2008 was a banner year for Weird Tales magazine, and it's been around for 85 years. It's just the number one when it comes to uh, horror fiction, science fiction, that type of stuff. In my book, it's just absolutely spectacular. You're doing a wonderful job. Tell the, the folks at home a little bit about the magazine and some of the great authors you've had on in the past uh, couple years here. Well, thank you so much for talking about Weird Tales like that. Weird Tales is a very special magazine because it's the, it's the first fantasy magazine ever in the entire world. And as you said, last year we celebrated 85 years of Weird Tales. And the thing that also makes it very special and close to my heart is that, that I am only the second female editor ever of Weird Tales. So that, that was quite an honor for me when I was selected to do this. I have really enjoyed working with the people over there at Wildside Press, and I have to give major, major props to Steven Siegel because he's the one that has redesigned, revamped, and really relaunched this magazine. And he gave me the opportunity to show what I can do by seeking out and finding the most unusual, the weirdest, the most fantastical fiction that I could find. And I was excited to be working with writers that I already know and am well acquainted with, but also being very surprised by some of the amazing stuff that's out there from people that no one's ever heard of. A perfect example is I picked up a story on the slush pile from someone who I've never heard of before. And it was 16,000 words, which is usually much longer than you would, you would um, look at. And I originally was just going to just say, no, it's too long. But then I started to read it. And I got to the first page and the second page. I could not put this thing down. I didn't know who the guy was. I Googled his name. I still didn't know who he was. So finally, I just called him up on the phone and I said, who are you? And he laughed and he was kind of excited about it. But I published his story in the second issue that I did. And the name of the story is Renovations. And the name of the writer is Matthew Pridham. It was his mm -hmm. first published piece ever. And I think it was one of the first things he's ever written. And it's truly amazing. Truly amazing story. A haunted house story told from the point of view of the house. I'm familiar with the story. That was a spectacular story. Well, I absolutely love what you're doing with the magazine. You folks are doing a tremendous job, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about it. And I should mention, and, and maybe you can tell a little bit more about it, it's a great jumping on point for subscribers and fans out there because uh, I noticed at the newsstand that I'm looking at, the newest episode, or, well, the newest magazine, the newest edition, uh, the newest issue, has uh, Neil Gaiman... Uh, some stuff going on with that. And if you subscribe now, you get a Neil uh, Gaiman primer, to, uh, some type of uh, Neil, the Neil Gaiman, Gaiman reader to uh, subscribe. Yeah. Yes, the Neil Gaiman reader, which is a book, which, a oh, which has a collection of, of uh, Neil Gaiman writings. So, oh, so well, that's spectacular. And uh, folks at home, I know that there's a lot of Neil Gaiman fans that watch this show. You can't get a better magazine out there than uh, Weird Tales. It's been around for 85 years. It doesn't get nearly the props it should. So uh, absolutely, jump on. You're going to see the website. You can link on from our website. Go on there and think about subscribing. It's uh, really affordable. I subscribe. It's twenty dollars, and it's it's uh, some twenty dollars very well spent. So really think about it. And again, congratulations. You're doing a great job, and we're certainly looking forward to a great 2009. Me too. Okay. Well, now that I've got the two of you together, I uh, want to talk about some of the great uh, stuff you're doing. Uh, you guys are doing a tremendous job editing together. The newest you've done is Fast Ships Black Sails, an incredible collection of writers and incredible tales of uh, the sea. Some very bizarre, some what you'd expect. Uh, absolutely amazing. That's your newest. The New Weird we talked about, uh, I think the last time we had Jeff on, that's a pretty amazing uh, collection. And The Best American Fantasy are just three of the things you've worked on together. So first of all, tell us a little bit about uh, fast Ships, Black Sails, and tell us about how it is working together as a husband and wife team. Well, Fast, fast Ships, Black Sails was, was a lot of fun. It was different than the other anthologies you mentioned because it was an all-original anthology. Yeah. Um, New Weird and, and Best American Fantasy are both reprint anthologies, but this one was all original fiction. And Jeff and I had an idea of what it was that we wanted to do. It, it was a pirate anthology an anthology of pirate stories, and what we wanted to do was have a mixture of all different kinds of pirate stories, not just the usual traditional ones. Yeah, but we also wanted to make a rollicking, it was kind of like, I, I thought of it as like a counterpoint to the, the Predator novel, and then it's a rollicking adventure 
adventurous anthology. I mean, people who read the New Weird, which has, uh, I mean, it's very, which is, which I love, but is very dark and has an academic tone to certain parts of it. Um, again, it's kind of like going from, from Shriek to Predator. You read Fast Ships Black Sands, like, oh wow, they can also edit a commercial anthology. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, the same principles are involved, basically. It's just you're picking a different kind of story. And, and I really love a lot of the stories in there. The, uh, the Garth Nix is really great. The, Elizabeth uh, uh, Bear Ceremony story, Bujum in there, is kind of like a Lovecraft, a dark fantasy story set in, face with, in space with a living spaceship. And it's just absolutely, I, I think it's a great story. It's been picked up for a couple of years best. In fact, I think now, at last tally, four of the stories have been picked up for years best, um, which was very gratifying. Because, again, when you do something a little different, you're always a little nervous about what the reaction is going to be. Um, well, I think you really did a great job. I love the Garth Nix story. I'm a huge Michael Moorcock fan, and I loved his contribution. And uh, it's just a spectacular... I didn't know how much I was going to enjoy it until I picked it up. I read it in two, just two sittings in two days. I, I just absolutely loved it. The other one that, uh, that that was actually kind of unexpected was the Steampunk Anthology, because it hit the it hit stores... I don't know if we talked about this last time, but it hit stores about the same time the New York Times did an article on Steampunk. And uh, that thing has just been selling ever since. I mean, it's still getting reviewed, and here it is, like uh, you know, six, seven months later. So, yeah, I don't know if we mentioned that one. Why? Why don't you talk a little bit about that, both of you, and the the steampunk movement? Because I remember that from that anthology, there was a lot of some names that I might not have expected in the steampunk uh, movement that you had in, and some of their contributions were the best in in the entire collection. Well, the steampunk. Steampunk Anthology was similar to doing the new weird because, again, it was another reprint anthology talking about a specific subgenre of the genre. But steampunk really goes farther back than that. As, as um, a fiction genre, it really started when you look at Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. But more contemporary writers, it came out in the 80s with K.W. Jader and William Gibson and um, also um, Bruce Sterling. So we wanted to do something that showed the the breadth of of the genre by picking some of those iconic stories, but at the same time also seeing what else was out there that was also in the steampunk world. Yeah, it's just um, it's just funny because the the real uh, vitality in the field right now. I mean, when you when we did steampunk, it was kind of like, well, we're kind of doing not a tombstone, but you're doing a <laughs> you're doing an anthology about something that's in the past, right? Um, and 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 what's funny is that it's um it's so vital because the subculture, which comes out of people watching actually the movies and comics and things like that, and, and reading the comics, uh, and and then and then dressing up, you know, in, in pseudo Victorian stuff, and then coming back to the literature. So like we would go to some of these uh, steampunk convention in California, and they would be buying the steampunk anthology because Although they were all steampunks, they didn't have any idea about where the literature had come from. And so it's been an interesting thing where uh, that anthology for us has been very much a learning experience because we didn't actually know that much about the steampunk subculture and all the do-it-yourself, maker movement uh, aspects of that, the green technology uh, aspects of that. So so that that was the most interesting anthology in terms of what, what we learned on the back end, I think. Um, but it was also a good example of how we work together, um, just in terms of how we put the, the put anthologies together. Um, I mean, I think Anne does a lot of the the hard work of, of you know, I had an idea of what some of the iconic stories were, and then Anne came along and she had these ideas of other things that would fit in. I think um, probably my favorite part of doing any of these anthologies is the reading, because that's truly what I love, because that's what I am. I'm a reader, and so I enjoy reading all the stories. And um, that was one of the things that I spent most of my focus on is reading, rereading, rereading, and reading again. Yeah, she has a really good BS detector, which is to say that, that I can sometimes be, be uh, you know, I can be drawn in by a superstar name or something, you know, in a way, at least initially. Or, or uh, you know, I'll be so busy that I won't necessarily be able to do more than, than read something enough to know that it, I'm interested in it. Um, but Anne's, Anne's really great at careful readings of all the stories, which is why she publishes so many great new writers of Weird Tales, because that, that it's, a very, it's a very difficult talent to... It's really easy to take something by Clive Barker. It's another thing entirely to take a first or second sale, and there are a couple of those actually in, in the Steampunk reprint anthology. So. Well, I think you guys do a great job with the anthologies in the fact that you 
bring authors uh, to people's attentions that they may not know. For example, in The New Weird, I really enjoyed that. And K.J. Bishop had a story that I really, really enjoyed. I then looked up uh, that he's got a lot of other works out there and there's different stuff going on, but I wasn't very familiar with his work. And that's something that goes through throughout your uh, anthologies is that you bring some people to the uh, public's eye that they may not be aware of. And I think you do a really great job of, of bringing some great new writers to the forefront. And thank you so much for doing that. Well, thanks. And what's interesting about that is we, because we also combine writers that are genre and, and ones that are more known for like the literary mainstream, but write some fantasy or, or science fiction or, or horror. Um, when we do readings and stuff, or even just in the correspondence back and forth, a lot of writers come into contact with one another who haven't before. And that, that over the, I think that over the, the history of our editorial collaborations is the thing I'm most proud mm -hmm. of because you find people who become best friends or actually literally collaborate or become influenced by people they never ever would have thought to even look up, um, otherwise. So, so that, that's something behind the scenes that doesn't really have anything to do with what, what readers see that, that I really like when we do an anthology like The New Weird or Steampunk. And I, we like bringing that diversity to it. And also when you're talking about something that's so well known like steampunk, to be able to bring a fresh face to it, a new look, something that, that, you know, someone who thinks they might know everything there is to know about steampunk, they pick something up like this and they find something new. And that's really what it's all about. Okay. Well, we're almost running out of time here, guys. So, uh, why don't you tell us what's going to be the next thing we should be looking out for from the two of you? Okay. Well, the next thing that, that we're working on or, or the, that I'm primarily focused on right now is called The Kosher Guide to Imaginary Animals, The Evil Monkey Dialogues. Now what this is, is it's going to be a small, lavishly illustrated hardcover gift book in, in which I have a conversation with Evil Monkey, Evil Monkey being Jeff's um, alter ego, discussing, discussing different imaginary animals such as unicorns and chupacabra and whether or not they're kosher and why or why not. And of course, as you know, when you have conversations with Evil Monkey, these conversations can get quite heated. And so anyway, that's the next book that, that, that we're working on right now. And that should be out just in time for the holidays. I'd say, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah, around about that time. And also makes a great gift for Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds spectacular. <laughs> Jeff, what do you have coming up? Quickly? So that's one, one, one of the very yeah. many projects. And Jeff can tell you about some of the others. Um, well, I have another thing that I'm pretty excited about called Book Life, uh, Strategies and Survival Tips for the 21st Century Writer, which is coming out in August. And it basically takes everything that I've learned over the last 25 years from all different sides of being in the book industry and boils it down to how can you have both a sustainable career and sustainable creativity, especially with all the new media and the way we get fragmented by email and the Internet and everything else, and yet at the same time are told we need to promote our work. And so book life is really about how do you stay sane and productive while you're doing all this stuff, and, and how can you lead a productive life in, in this new world that we're living in when it comes to books? And I'm really excited about that, along with, of course, Finch, the, uh, the new Ambergris novel. Excellent. Well, folks, it's been an absolute pleasure having the both of you on. I'm, I'm a big fan of both of your works, as, as you both know. Uh, again, thank you so much for being on the show, and uh, you've just been wonderful guests. Well, Thanks thank so you much. again for, for having us. Folks at home, that wraps up another edition of Cult Pop. I know there was a lot of information covered. You're going to want to know about them. Just go to our website, and you've seen their website throughout the show. But visit us at www.cult-pop.com, and you can get all the information again. Thanks so much for watching.